Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's Mike here at Game From Scratch and another GDC has come to a close. And now what we're going to do is look at Unity's session from GDC. They did a session called the Unity 6 and Beyond a Roadmap. Now this is exactly what it says, kind of a description of what is to expect in the upcoming release of Unity 6. Yes, this is the one with the runtime fee and what we can expect shortly beyond that. Now they didn't get a lot into the future stuff and truth of the matter is if you attended Unite or you watched my coverage of Unite and what to expect from Unity, a lot of this is going to are to be familiar to you. There wasn't a lot of big announcements from Unity this year at GDC, but there were definitely a few interesting things. So this whole video is available, by the way, the uh, roadmap session. If you want to go ahead and check out the entire hour-long thing, you can, but instead we're going to do a very condensed version of it. So let's just go ahead and jump right in. So we're going to jump around a little bit because we're following the order of the roadmap itself and they covered some things kind of a little bit out of sequence. And we're going to start things off with the pipeline. So that's the scriptable render pipeline and the built-in pipeline. We have committal that uh, the built-in pipeline is still going to be supported uh, through the entirety of Unity 6. That kind of leads me to believe that Unity 7, it's dead as a dodo, but eventually they're going to have to move beyond that. They also made the announcement that 90% of games on Steam in 2023 used a scriptable render pipeline. A third of which was HDRP, which by by natural deduction, I would assume that the other 70% were using the uh, universal render pipeline, both a mix of 2D and 3D there. Uh, and on mobile and XR, it was a 50% level. So it's definitely when it comes to mobile titles, they're going to have to get buy-in for people moving away from the built-in pipeline over to the scriptable rendering pipelines. But that was an update they had there. They also talked about three major performance improvements on the rendering side. Uh, the big one is the GPU resident drawer, uh, which I really want to call drawer, drawer. Uh, this is how the GPU um, organizes and optimizes scenes. Pretty much, it should be one of those turnkey free technologies that just gets you faster frame rates. I know that sounds too good to be true, but that basically seems to be what this one is all about. Another thing on the performance side of things uh, was GPU occlusion culling. Uh, this is basically where the GPU tells itself what not to render in the future. Again, a major performance optimization feature. Uh, there's kind of jokes out there that if you, as long as you put a large rock in front of your scene, you get amazing performance because that was part of what they did in the demo. And then another one they've got is spatial temporal post-processing. Now this is Unity's inbuilt upscaling solution. Think of the likes of um, FRS and DLSS. Well, that is what uh, spatial temporal post-processing is all about, uh, but that will be cross-platform and built directly into the engine tools. Speaking of tools, we had a couple of announcements of new tools coming to Unity itself. Uh, the one is the Render Graph View. Uh, this is for understanding how render passes perform and so on. Shader Graph Heat Map, which will show you what most expensive nodes are in your shader graph. And the VFX Profiling Tool, which shows um, what VFX are using in terms of memory usage and performance. So basically three new optimization tools there. We also have some changing when it comes to lighting. Uh, this is going to be a little repeat of a little bit later on with time of day stuff, just a bit of a warning there. Uh, but we have adaptive probe volumes, which basically automate light probe placement in your world should make creating nice lighting solutions easier for you. Uh, time of day and large world changes. So you can now bake different lights by time of day and then take those baked results and blend between them. So if you want to have like a, a dusk uh, between, you know, morning and afternoon or whatever, however the hell dusk works out. You can do that with baked lighting and then blend between the two sets of rendered baked lights. And then, of course, we've got the new GPU-based light maker. Uh, they removed their light mapping solution, a third-party tool, a while ago, and they need to replace it. And the GPU light mapper is that replacement. They also say it's going to use uh, less memory, better performance, because it's all GPU-based going forward. But yeah. Another advancement, kind of in the same category, open world stuff, uh, is their new water systems. So you now have currents with flow maps, as well as uh, foam generators for objects that are floating in your water system as well. Uh, improved rendering, including interaction with clouds, as well as um, compatibility with transparents. Uh, and then there's also new water system demos out there. There's also some other graphical effects for, you know, world-based stuff. Uh, so the there is now night skies with stars and planets, all configurable, also time of day support on that one as well. We also have uh, atmospheric scattering, uh, including uh, improved sky shader, which has ozone layer simulations to it as well. 
Next up, we had a few Speed Tree announcements. Speed Tree 10 is coming. Uh, Speed Tree is the tree creation tool that they bought a while ago. I've been waiting for them to do like an Unreal Engine here and like integrate it in and give it to developers. Sadly, that has not happened. They have made some updates to Speed Tree though. So new organic tools like the Vine tool, new workflow for shaping plants and an updated UX, as well as compatibility with a number of the new rendering features that are coming in uh, Unity 6. Uh, then we get into the AI stuff. We're gonna kind of jump back and forth between AI things. I know this is groan worthy for many people, uh, but I know some people are definitely interested in it. But uh, Muse, uh, asset generations improving, uh, better sprites, more realistic textures, and PBR texture creation uh, that you can create PBR textures from both text, uh, input geometry, or reference images, and you can have it automatic texturing coming along with it. That's all coming a little bit later on. Um, we also have uh, Muse Behavior for creating decision trees from prompts. So basically, this can create uh, animations and animation state uh, from uh, basically a text prompt. Describe what you want. You can also use, in instead of text prompts, sketches. Uh, also, you're going to be able to create sound effects from text prompts. But these are all future uh, features. None of them are there yet, and they all have me a little skeptical. Uh, then we move on to some new productivity features, or just like top-level improvements of Unity itself. Uh, so you have project-wide input actions uh, with pre preset default actions. So if you're doing input maps at a project level, should be a lot easier to configure and set up at this point. Uh, and you improved job profiling uh, via timeline view in the profiler, addressable presets, uh, platform specific defaults when dealing with addressable. So I should handle some of the, like the resource setup times being a little bit easier to work with because you're gonna have all these presets to work with. And then we moved on to the cloud. The start of the show with cloud is probably DAM, uh, the Unity Asset Manager. Uh, it's an interface over your 3D model game assets. It kind of integrates with source control. It gives you a way to basically uh, share and manage all of the 3D files that are in your scene. Uh, and then there's also, uh, it's going to get versioning, custom statuses, bulk editing, commenting, annotations, and asset dependency tracking all added in. Those are future features, by the way. Uh, the asset manager and version control are also all going to be more tightly integrated into the editor. Uh, another update on kind of the rendering side, like I said, they, they jump around a little bit in the way they cover things, uh, is customizable UI shapes and backgrounds can be now created procedurally with shader graph. Uh, the VFX graph also get gained uh, six-way lighting, motion vectors, and camera buffers if you're using the, the ERP or the Universal Render Pipeline, while HDRP got ray tracing and volumetric fog output uh, on top of various different UX experiences like uh, the shader graph and VFX graphs all have like hotkey support now, little things like that. Next, there were a number of announcements on the multiplayer side of things. We, knew have, we will now have this multiplayer center. Uh, it's an in-editor portal for quickly setting up multiplayer configurations and services with like a template genre-driven design. So you could say, I'm creating an FPS or I'm creating a sports game or something. And it kind of sets up logical defaults for you. Uh, also, it's going to configure in the various different services that you might want to use for your multiplayer end-to-end -end stack. Uh, there's also, and this is probably my favorite new feature across the board for all of this, uh, is the multiplayer play mode. It's a way of like running and emulating multiple clients on a single computer. So if you want to test your networking capabilities, but you don't want to run multiple different machines, multiplayer play mode will enable you to do that. Now, how you're going to bring yourself to play four or five different instances of your game at the same time, I do not know. Now, another aspect of this is integration into their relay service, uh, which will enable you to invite remote players to connect to and test your game instance as well. Uh, they've got some stuff about dedicated server. I didn't fully understand exactly what they were talking about there, to be honest, but the cool announcement was that Transport Package, this is their new low-level uh, cross-platform networking stack that everything else is built on top of. Well, it now works with Unity Web, so that means that the Transport uh, Communication Packages now works across all various platforms that are out there. Actually, some cool announcements about Web. We'll get back to that one in just a a minute. Uh, another new solution is distributed authority, which enables you to spread simulation workloads across clients on the network instead of all being done on a server. So if your game is doing server side calculations, you can actually spread that around all the various different clients that are connected to your game. Uh, it's a way of basically cutting costs on your server requirement by offloading that work onto the client. So it's interesting to see how that actually works out. And then they announced Unity Matchmaker, which is uh, again, a game matchmaker. You can have it set up for like skill-based matchmaking matchmaking on different metrics, such as the number of wins they've got, what weapons or loadout they've chose, uh, the achievements that they've managed, and so on. So if you need to have game matchmaking, you don't want to roll your own, they have a solution for 
that. Um, and then they've got uh, debugging tools to give you insights in how the actual matchmaker sessions are going. And that's all live feedback. So you see it as games are being played. Uh, another side of things that they covered was something called Safe Voice. Now this is AI and machine learning solution for voice and text chat for detecting you know, toxic behavior, basically Xbox Live. So Xbox Live would just be turned off if it used safe chat. So all of those people like screaming in your ear or yelling profanities at you, this is basically saying that machine learning is gonna be able to take care of that stuff for you. Uh, and then they're um, also rolling out safe text, which is gonna take text-based chat. And it does things like gets rid of profanity and insulting speech and so on, Censor, basically real-time censorship uh, of text uh, in your game. And kind of an interesting approach, to be honest. Another new improvement they announced was build profiles. So you can create multiple different build process with completely different settings and completely different scene lists. On top of that, there is a completely new pl um, platform browser for like the various different OS supports that are out there, just basically replacing the existing settings there. Uh, back to talking a little bit more about the web. Uh, so some pretty big announcements here. We now have support for a mobile web browser, specifically iOS and Android, uh, as well as support for Facebook and Messenger Instant Games. And perhaps more importantly, they partnered with Google to give uh, experimental, I believe, uh, web GPU backend support. And that can integrate with like the VFX and shader graph and so on. So uh, Web GPU is coming to Unity as well. So the web platforms definitely benefited in that regard. A couple of other platform announcements there as well. Uh, ARM support on Windows for the six people that are using Windows ARM devices. Uh, they support it both as a platform and as well as, as a uh, uh, well, platform. It's basically you can target ARM64 with your game and you can run the Unity editor on top of ARM64 as well. This is actually a big announcement if you're working in the ARM64 space uh, because once you've got native binaries, you should be able to take advantage of more of the ARM stuff instead of running through a compatibility layer, which should mean things like better performance, better battery life, and so on if you're working on an ARM64 device. There's not a lot of Windows ARM64 devices out there, uh, especially capable of running something like Unity, uh, but support is there both in the editor and as a target platform. Uh, we also have support on Android side of things for play asset delivery or pad. Uh, this basically gives you the ability to um, reduce the initial download size of your game, kind of stream in the rest as you need it. Uh, on top of that, they've got new streaming capabilities and compression abilities so that you can download the texture set that is most appropriate to the device you're on. So if you're on a low-end device, it'll bring in, say, 512 by 512 textures, whereas if you're on a high-end device, it might bring in 4K textures. Uh, so that is all on the Android side of things via the Play Asset Delivery and some new compression formats and so on uh, supporting that. Uh, in terms of builds for consoles, uh, faster console build times on IL to CPP. Uh, after your first build, it can be up to 50% faster. Uh, everyone likes faster compile, so I don't think anyone's gonna complain there. And then we got announcements on the XR side of things, uh, specifically support for the MetaQuest 3 and the Apple Vision Pro. Uh, we also got a number of new uh, XR features in there. Some subset of that include things like foveated rendering, uh, AR Core Vulkan support on Android devices, custom hand gestures, XR device simulation and more, uh, plus support for composition layers so you can do things like render text, video, UI, and images at a higher quality using the runtime compositor layer support. Uh, then we finally got some announcements around DOTS and ECS. So ECS is now considered production ready. Uh, so you can use it in your games. DOTS and ECS, the DOTS stands for Data Oriented Technology Stack. Uh, ECS is Entity Component System. There's a whole bunch of things that go together. There's other things in there like the Burst Compiler. Basically, it's a new way of organizing and working with data inside of the Unity game engine. And the ultimate outcome is to make your code more parallelizable. Parallel -sizable. Ugh, I'm mangling that one. You can make your code more parallel in the way that it deals with data. And ultimately this is all about making things faster. Uh, they released a demo. Uh, this was actually done a couple weeks ago, but the Mega City project is back. Now it is available as a hundred plus player uh, multiplayer experience using ECS and DOTS. Uh, they've had some updates to ECS over the time. So ECS 1.1 added physics collider workflow and performance improvements. 1.2 added quality of life improvements and other performance fixes, as well as serialization and baking support. And 1.3 added physics scalability improvements, as well as net code for entity fixes. 
Uh, and then we move on from there, talking about how they're, and th this is a good move for Unity. Uh, people like game objects, but people don't necessarily like ECS or maybe just don't want to learn ECS. Well, they're doing more and more work to actually make game objects work with entities. Now, part of that is going to be by uh, making transforms, transforms. So uh, the transform, so like the position in space for a game object is going to be compatible with um, the way it's done in dots as well. So you can have dots logic uh, that is handling moving a bunch of things around, and that could include game objects in there as well. So there's going to be compatibility there with how transformations work and also in how scenes and the editor workflow. Uh, and they're also using um, ECS in the editor itself more. So we should see spilled up uh, some build, uh, some speed improvements in things like the animation and world building tools that are coming. And then finally, uh, they announced that core CLR porting is continuing. Uh, this is an ongoing project, but moving to core CLR for mono will give us better build times, better ID integration, uh, better runtime performance, uh, more up-to-date C-sharp support, and so on. This is still in development. They're testing it internally and uh, no commitment for when this is going to happen. So uh, that is the development on the uh, C-sharp side of things. And that's it, really. Uh, that's the Unity 6 roadmap and beyond. Again, a lot of this we already knew about from the Unite sessions uh, at the end of last year. Not a lot new revealed here, but that gives you an idea of where they're going with Unity 6. Um, it's going to be a while, and I th actually think that Unity 7 is going to be a pretty big change from there, but not a lot of insights into where they're going with Unity 7 quite yet. But hey, Unity 6 isn't here yet, so I guess that makes sense. We shouldn't get too ahead of ourselves. That's actually one of those things that Unity was really guilty of in the past, is just promising too much up front, and then we end up waiting, like, you know, seven years for dots to actually be usable. I think they've learned that lesson a little bit. But on the whole, if I'm honest, a kind of boring GDC from Unity. But I'm curious, what do you think of this roadmap, of the way things are going, you know, beyond the things? And that's it. I'll talk to you all later. Goodbye.